with Senate Update, I'm Julie Bartke. Senator Carla Nelson is moving legislation that, if passed, could expedite finding a cure for Alzheimer's disease. Among its provisions are $5 million for both 2016 and 2017 for dementia research and an additional $750,000 in grants to be used to connect caregivers and patients with resources. She detailed her bill in the Senate Health, Human Services and Housing Committee, but prior to that, we caught up with her to get her personal story on the issue. Yes, well, my father is in the latter stages of Alzheimer's, so we have kind of walked this journey from the time where we suspected um, until then we had the physician's appointment and we did get that diagnosis that again we suspected but at the same time we dreaded because there are no cures at this point. Um, and so we've seen that progress and certainly I have experienced it as a daughter as has my whole family but I see many people just like me and my family who are going through the very same Thing. And what I've realized is that um, it is such a staggering disease in every term of cost, emotional cost, personal cost, cost to society, uh, stresses on our systems, stresses on families. Um, and when you look at the high cost and then you look at the increase in the incidence because of our aging population, it's staggering. It's a tsunami uh, that I'm just experiencing, but for the next 19 years, we are going to experience in significantly higher numbers. And so that was really the genesis of, uh, of the Alzheimer's Research and Support Act. And again, Senator Nelson detailed her proposal to the Senate Health, Human Services and Housing Committee. Uh, the goal is to determine the causes, prevention, treatment, and cures for Alzheimer's disease and other dementias through the advancement of research uh, to provide and enhance care and support for all those affected and to reduce the risk of dementia through the promotion of brain health. Now I believe my testifiers today um, will uh, speak to you about the incidents and the importance of research and then I will follow up with a few um, final comments and also um, an actual walk through the bill so you actually know exactly uh, what you have in front of you. It's pretty straightforward. Uh, but with that, Madam Chair, I would like to uh, introduce Dr. Clifford Jack, Professor of Diagnostic Radiology and Alexander Family Professor of Alzheimer's Disease Research at the Mayo Clinic. Um, good afternoon, Madam Chair and members of the committee. My name Welcome, is Dr. Jack. Welcome. Thanks. I didn't it's hear. <laughs> I can't talk. It is. The, thank you. Uh, because you couldn't hear me, it reminds me to tell you all that this, the, this is a, acoustics in here are terrible, so you almost have to put your mouth on the microphone in order for us to hear you. So please, uh, to the best of your ability, would you try to do that? Sure. Better? Yes. All right. Thank you. Okay, so my name is Clifford Jack. I'm a neuroradiologist at the Mayo Clinic and I'm a full-time clinician researcher on cognitive aging and dementia with a focus on brain imaging. And I'm here to speak about dementia and Alzheimer's disease. Dementia refers to clinical symptomatology characterized by difficulties in thinking and in one's ability to carry out daily functions. Alzheimer's disease is one form or cause of dementia, but it is by far the most common. It's progressive, meaning it's not reversible, and is the most common illness leading to nursing home placement. The greatest risk factor by far is old age. The incidence doubles every five years after the age of 60, such that about half of all people over age 85 have dementia. Currently, there are 100,000 individuals in Minnesota diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease. At a national level, at present, over 5 million people are diagnosed with dementia, but with the aging demographics of our society, projected United States numbers by 2050 are estimated to range between 11 and 16 million people. By 2050, annual costs in the United States are estimated at $1 trillion per year, with a cumulative cost from today to 2050 of over $20 trillion. This is clearly not economically sustainable. But these are only the measurable costs because 70% of patients with dementia live at home and not in a care facility. In the United States in 2009, an estimated 11 million unpaid caregivers, mainly family members, provided 12.5 billion hours of care to patients with dementia. These costs are not captured in statistics on healthcare economics. 
But again, money, monetary costs are actually only part of the picture. The most significant costs are the very personal costs to the patient, the family, and to loved ones. As you know, at present, there is no cure and no form of prevention. Available treatments address symptoms only and realistically only do so modestly in some patients and for a limited period of time. There are no currently available treatments that alter the inexorable downward trajectory of the disease. With that background, it may come as a surprise that historically funding for dementia and Alzheimer's research has been very low in comparison to other major diseases. We've all heard nothing but negative news about the serial failures of every disease-modifying therapeutic trial in Alzheimer's disease to date. But most people working in this field actually see a quite hopeful future. In recent years, there's been a major shift in thinking about the disease. The driving intellectual force today centers on the idea that the greatest hope for a cure is through prevention. Accordingly, a great deal of research is now focused on the earliest possible identification of the disease process, research on improved methods of early detection, and research on finding disease-modifying interventions go hand in hand because prevention can only occur if the disease is detected early and then treatment is instituted early. A key issue is identifying those factors that differentiate the earliest evidence of Alzheimer's disease from the subtle and benign decline in cognitive abilities that characterizes normal uh, aging. In conclusion, I can't think of a more timely opportunity for Minnesota to expand its role in fighting dementia and Alzheimer's disease. Minnesota is particularly well positioned to lead research in this area because of our world-class research programs in early detection and the basic science of disease mechanisms. The proposed legislation will augment the resources of an already active community of investigators and provide support for agencies charged with pr the provision of services. As someone who has dedicated his career to research in this area, it's uplifting to see that the state of Minnesota is rising to the challenge of combating what many consider to be the defining medical problem of the 21st century. Thank you again for the op opportunity to address the committee. Thank you, Dr. Jack. Senator Nelson. Uh, Madam Chair, um, would you like uh, to hold uh, questions till the till the end? Yes. yes, till the end. I'd also like to introduce then uh, Dr. Joseph Gogler, uh, Assistant Professor for the Center on Aging at the University of Minnesota. Thank you so much, Senator Nelson, Madam Chair, and members. I'm really thrilled to have the opportunity to provide testimony in support of Bill 247 today. Um, as Senator Nelson mentioned, uh, my name is Joe Gogler. I'm an associate professor in the Center on Aging and School of Nursing at the University of Minnesota. And my research interests specifically are in Alzheimer's disease and long-term care, and specifically how we can best support families who care for loved ones with Alzheimer's disease. And I want to take this opportunity to talk a little bit about how does Alzheimer's disease affect families in Minnesota, what are some of the things we're trying to do to better support those families in Minnesota, and how could a, bell, a bill such as SF-247 actually help advance these efforts. <clears throat> some of this reiterates what Dr. Jack had already reviewed, but uh, specifically uh, because uh, aging is a risk factor and because of the aging of the Minnesota population, we can expect an increase of uh, roughly 36 percent over the next 10 years of people with Alzheimer's disease. Um, estimates vary in terms of actual numbers, but I think the percentage is probably pretty accurate. So clearly this is not a, something that is going away. I titled this particular slide, Alzheimer's disease as the chronic condition. As Dr. Jack had mentioned, it is one of the defining, it is the defining medical condition for us to grapple with in the 21st century. And as you can see, when one number one looks at just total health care costs for people with Alzheimer's disease over the age of 65, specifically Medicare beneficiaries compared to those without Alzheimer's, costs are three times as great. Um, and when you actually look at who we would call quote unquote super utilizers of healthcare, usually older persons with multiple co-occurring chronic conditions, if that person happens to have Alzheimer's disease, their costs go up exponentially. So that really to me makes the case that Alzheimer's disease isn't just a chronic disease, it's probably the chronic disease that complicates effective treatment and management of all other types of chronic disease and chronic conditions among older persons. So in that regard, um, it is something that is no doubt worthy of our attention and is certainly worthy of our attention as Minnesotans. So I think as many of us are too painfully aware, Alzheimer's disease has ripple effects. It doesn't just affect the person with Alzheimer's disease. It doesn't just affect healthcare systems. It affects the family members who must care for these persons. And quite frankly, family members 
are the bulk of the long-term care system, both in Minnesota and the United States. Currently, at least as of 2013, there's 245,000 family caregivers. These caregivers provided 280 million hours of care in 2013. Now, health economists sometimes try to attach a dollar value to this family care. And what they do is they basically estimate the replacement cost. If these family caregivers just went away and home health care aid or some similar professional needed to be hired, what would the value of family caregiving be? Quite frankly, I think that's a conservative approach, but nonetheless, that's the approach taken. And that value in 2013 Minnesota was $3.5 billion. Now, to put some context to that, if you looked at the Fortune 500 companies of 2013 and the annual revenue of those companies, company number 500, which incidentally is a Minnesota company, Nash Finch Company, reported an annual revenue of $4.8 billion. So essentially family caregiving is nearly a Fortune 500 industry in and of itself in Minnesota. Okay. Now, on, while this is highly valuable, if not priceless, in terms of what families do in Minnesota, the health care costs for family caregivers uh, <coughs> are, are high. Those, again, of person, of family caregivers of persons with Alzheimer's disease in Minnesota, their health care costs were $161 million greater than non-caregivers in Minnesota. And certainly the costs of Alzheimer's caregiving extend well beyond the financial. Um, providing care over multiple years can cause psychological distress, emotional burden, and can it eventually spill over into other life domains of the family member. For example, work-life balance. We know that over half of all caregivers who provide help to some a relative with dementia report some type of disruption in work because of care responsibilities, and 9% report leaving work entirely. So again, the ripple effect of Alzheimer's extends beyond the person to both the family, to healthcare systems, and quite frankly to employers as well. What I wanted to do here real briefly was to kind of think about, number one, some of the work we've been doing at the University of Minnesota in supporting caring families, but more importantly, how could something like SF, uh, this particular bill, really advance that work? Um, I run a group of projects called Families and LTC, and really the basis and focus of these projects are how can we develop programs that best support family caregivers of persons with Alzheimer's disease. For example, one project, the NYU CIAC, this was a comprehensive psychosocial support program for adult children who cared for parents with dementia. We've just started publishing the results of this project over the last couple of years. We found that providing comprehensive psychosocial support to families actually allowed them to, to keep their relatives at home for 231 days longer than those who didn't receive the program. So taking this family level kind of approach and helping to treat and manage Alzheimer's disease is quite effective and perhaps cost effective as well. A lot of our work influences the community outreach and engagement we do, primarily this Caring for a Person with Memory Loss Conference, which is an annual conference we hold at the University of Minnesota. It includes 200 to 300 attendees. It's free. Um, we live stream it uh, and record it so anybody throughout the state or beyond can virtually attend. Um, and has been a great success and it's been something we've been so doing since 2008. What would be great is if we could take a model like this, which is influenced by the research we do, and take it on the road in Minnesota. One of my goals with this conference is I don't want to just hold it physically at the University of Minnesota. I would love to hold it in all the different area agencies on, age, on aging throughout greater Minnesota. A bill such as SF, uh, SF uh, 247, I'm sorry should definitely, would definitely be able to support an initiative such as this. You know, providing this community education, community outreach, really related to brain health, brain fitness, et cetera. And, and, and that's just one possible example of how a bill such as this could really support our work. I'd be remiss if I didn't mention all the other great researchers at the University of Minnesota who are doing incredible work on both the biological mechanisms of Alzheimer's, pharmacological and non-pharmacological treatments and health services work. I've listed only a very few here, but these are all members of the group we call the Twin Cities Consortium of Alzheimer's Research, where all of us from these different disciplines and multiple health organizations are coming together to better understand how we can best tackle Alzheimer's disease. A main point of emphasis has been prevention, has been outreach, and I think, again, something like like SF-247 could ideally help continue to support these efforts. And I want to emphasize Twin Cities Consortium is kind of a misnomer because, in fact, we include members from throughout the state of Minnesota who participate and advance this mission, again, of trying to not only prevent Alzheimer's disease but support those families and persons with memory loss most effectively. Thank you, Dr. Doc Gogler. Senator Nelson, we have maybe uh, 12 minutes, so uh, I, wouldn't, I want to reserve time for you to give the essence of the bill to us as well and, and offer I'd like questions. I'd uh, make a couple comments uh, and then I'd like to turn it over to Marv and uh, then I will wrap up. 
So um, I think what you've heard today is the incidence of Alzheimer's is skyrocketing. Uh, it's the sixth leading cause of death. Uh, and as you know, it's tied um, to risk uh, is of age. Age is one of the biggest risk factors. A couple things just for you to think about as we grapple with this as policymakers. Uh, the U.S. Uh, population age 65 and above is expected to double by 2030, double. Uh, and of course that, Minnesota is no different. Um, one out of nine people who are age 65 have Alzheimer's. And by age 85, it's one out of three. Alzheimer's increase, deaths have increased 68% from 2000 to 2010. So as you can see, the incidence is skyrocketing across our nation. And just to think um, about the magnitude of this problem, and you know it's tied to age, uh, every day 10,000 baby boomers wake up and turn 65 in this country. And that's going to continue every day. Each and every day, another 10,000 hit that 65 mark. Um, for the next 19 years. That's the magnitude of the problem we face. And Minnesota is no exception. Since uh, 2014 uh, to 2020, we will see a 12% increase in Alzheimer's. And from 20 to 25, or by 2025, it will be a 21% increase in Alzheimer's. And over 5 million Americans are living with Alzheimer's, including, as you heard, an estimated 100,000 in Minnesota and their caregivers. And um, the other thing to keep in mind with this uh, epidemic of Alzheimer's is the cost associated with, you, with it. I'd like you to look at the brochure in front of you. 20% uh, of our Medicare <coughs> dollars are spent on a person with Alzheimer's. One out of five dollars is already being spent to uh, take care of people with Alzheimer's in this country. Uh, $214 billion were spent on Alzheimer's in 2014. 150 million of that is um, Medicare and Medicaid. And, and you will notice the graph that shows how many research dollars we have uh, compared to the cost. So it's staggering. Uh, Minnesota is not exempt. More Minnesota families, just like mine, are going to be touched with Alzheimer's. And it's going to be at a, at a frightening rate, as we've discussed. And uh, we've discussed that in addition to the human suffering, we're talking about the strain on the health care system and families, and of course then the enormous burden that it uh, puts on family, state, and federal budgets. Um, and with that, I would like to turn uh, the testimony over to Dr. Marv Lofquist, who um, <coughs> will share some comments with you uh, about the disease. Thank you. Welcome, Dr. Lofquist, to the committee. Uh, thank you. Uh, good afternoon, mm -hmm. Madam Chairman. Uh, and members of the committee. My name is Marvin Lofquist, and I thank you for the opportunity to speak with you today. I grew up in a family with a history of heart disease. Both my parents died of heart disease by the age of 65, and both my older and younger brothers have had bypass surgeries. Prior to my diagnosis, I had limited awareness of the warning signs of Alzheimer's disease and never expected that I would one day be living with the disease. In 2010, after retiring from Northwestern University as an associate dean of the Weinberg College of Arts and Sciences, my wife and Elaine and I moved from Chicago to Minneapolis to be closer to our children and grandchildren. After the move, I began to notice that I was not making much progress in learning the names of surrounding streets and new acquaintances. I soon found that I could not remember details about our appointments or social events, even if I saw them listed on our calendar. At a checkup with our family doctor, my wife and I shared our concerns regarding my increasing difficulty remembering details. The doctor recommended a variety of medical and psychological tests that led to the diagnosis of early stage Alzheimer's disease in May of 2012. The diagnosis would confirm my worst fear, but I knew I had to accept this as my new reality. After giving ourselves time to feel sad about this diagnosis, Elaine and I decided to share the information with our children and other close family members. To them and others, we focus on how Elaine and I have chosen to live our lives moving forward. 
We believe it is important to be open with others in order to reduce the stigma associated with this disease and to surround ourselves with support. After the diagnosis, my neuropsychologist recommended the HABIT program at the Mayo Clinic, which provides education about mild cognitive impairment for patients and their care partners. Through this program, we learned about the Alzheimer's Association and began attending an early stage support group program through the Minnesota North Dakota chapter. I quickly decided that if I was going to have Alzheimer's, I was going to get involved and see how I could help as an advocate. In a personal way, when I talk to other people about the disease, I am also talking to myself. As I am encouraging others to be strong in their determination to live well with the disease, I am also hearing this message and strengthening my own resolve. I can be tall. I can be short. I can have cancer. I can have heart disease. I can have Alzheimer's disease. But I am still Marvin Lofquist. I am still Elaine's husband. I still have a son, David, and a daughter, Laura. I am still Marv. I'm still me. Having a PhD in chemistry gives me the natural inclination to look for ways to support research to combat this disease. This motivation led to my enrollment in the Alzheimer's Association's trial match and the pursuit of participation in clinical trials. Research is the way we learn how things work. Research is how we can find what molecular changes are helpful and which are not. Disease is the result of unhelpful changes. We need to find ways to stop these unhelpful changes or reverse them. Sounds simple to me, but as you know, it is far more complex. <clears throat> uh, Senator Nelson, I think we need to move now to uh, uh, some questions, uh, if it's possible. We're, we're yes, uh, uh, Madam Chair, I think Marv might have had just a couple more comments, if, if he could uh, yeah. please complete those. Okay. I currently serve on the Minnesota North Dakota Advisory Council and the National Early Stage Advisory Group. Over the years, I had served on various boards, and when I retired, I planned on serving <coughs> on other boards. My involvement in the Alzheimer's Association has restored my confidence that I can still contribute to society and make a difference through sharing my story. Addressing the scourge of Alzheimer's means supporting people living with the disease the care partners, and those doing the research to find a way to end Alzheimer's. These endeavors have cost, but they have value beyond calculation. Your support is monumental in the effort to end Alzheimer's. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Lovequist. Dr. Lovequist, uh, and, and I, I can just affirm what you're saying there, that your commitment to sharing your story does make, is going to make a difference here. So thank you for your time. Madam, Madam Chair, would you like me to do a walkthrough? Yes, yeah, so a quick walk through the bill, and then yes. uh, if people will be ready with their questions, yes. if you have them. Yes, thank you, Madam Chair and members. Uh, Senate File uh, 247 uh, sets up a grant program for Alzheimer's research. It's a $5 million grant program uh, focusing on those grants that have the greatest merit competitive grant program in finding causes, cures, treatment, and prevention. Uh, the money is um, appropriated uh, in this bill, or it's determined by the Commissioner of Health, and the amendment that we're going to adopt uh, is in, consult in consultation with uh, the HESO director. Um, and also, the other piece you need to know that uh, this bill sets up is the Alzheimer's Research Advisory Council to help determine which of those grants are going to help us uh, better tackle uh, this skyrocketing disease. And uh, that is a section of the bill as well where the Alzheimer's Research um, Advisory Council is set up. It's made up of 11 experts who can help determine what that is. And I will just read what those are to you so you understand that uh, it's on page uh, 1.29 in your bill. But um, the commissioner will appoint an 11-member advisory council consisting of two gerontologists, two geriatric psychiatrists, 
two geriatricians, two neuroscience, and three neurologists. So the point is, we have limited resources and we have a significant need. And my hope is that these competitive grants can be laser focused on those um, research proposals that have the greatest merit. Uh, the second aspect of the bill, besides the research grants, it, all sets, it also sets up dementia grants. It sets them up at a statewide level, statewide dementia grant program, and also then a regional and local dementia grant program. The purpose of that grant program, again, competitive grants, this time awarded through the Minnesota Board of Aging, uh, is to uh, select those grants that help promote Alzheimer's disease and other dementias awareness, promote the benefits of early cognitive testing in those populations at risk and early diagnosis. And you heard a lot about the caregivers um, and connecting caregivers to the existing resources that we have. Um, as I might have mentioned, my father has, uh, is in the latter stages of dementia, and I have seen firsthand how incredibly important it is that we connect families and caregivers to those resources uh, that are out there. Um, and then finally, Madam Chair and members, uh, this bill sets up the Alzheimer's Communication Program. This is a one-time appropriation through the Minnesota Board of Aging, which is, again, to start that uh, statewide conversation that we need about Alzheimer's testing, uh, prevention, cures, and, uh, and caregivers. Uh, and my, this, is, this part's not written into the bill, but as an example of how we can use existing resources, we've already have the senior linkage line uh, which is providing information to seniors, you know, looking at using some of our existing resources to um, help us tackle uh, this Alzheimer's um, tsunami that we're facing. And so the things I'd like the committee to take away, I have more comments, but I know you've been very patient, is that one, we know it's an epidemic. We know it's costly. It's coming at us, whether we're ready or not. Um, but Minnesota can, we have the structures in place, we can build upon the good work that this legislature has already done with the 2009 uh, Minnesota Alzheimer's Disease Working Group and preparing Minnesota to be a dementia capable uh, state. And so let's build upon that. We know research dollars are important to our state uh, and they bring a lot beyond the benefits of the research, they also add economic value to our state. So with that, I think there's probably committee members who have questions. Yes, and let's begin with our questions. Uh, I, I would say to the committee members, we have now uh, gone to the time that we have at the committee hearing. Uh, with your permission, I think we can see uh, the extent of questions that there are. If we can't get through them, we can lay this on the table uh, since the testifiers have completed and we can pick it up for action at another meeting. Um, but uh, for now, let's see where things are at. Senator Lori. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you for bringing this forward, um, Senator. I, um, I, I don't think there's a single one person I know who hasn't been touched by a family or a friend or a loved one who has suffered Alzheimer's or dementia, and I think that this is, would be um, incredibly helpful um, progress towards being able to connect um, caregivers and support givers, family and friends. Um, and in an effort to be, and I do understand the importance of research dollars to help us move forward. Um, in an effort to be helpful, um, I need to say clearly um, the chances of getting research dollars out of our very stretched um, Health and Human Services division are very, very, very slim. Um, we don't fund research out of the Health and Human Services budget. We have a world-class uh, research institution at the University of Minnesota, and their budget goes through um, higher ed. And so that's in the nature of uh, attempting to be helpful. And it is not the first attempt to try to um, uh, get Health and Human Services finance to fund research. And we've had tremendous pressure brought to bear to, to free, and, and were we to cross that threshold, we would be under tremendous pressure again and again and again with um, absolutely unmanageable um, requests to, to do primary research out of our 
health and human services budgets that are intended for direct care. Some of the um, outreach and, and linking people, that is things that we do when we have a long and proud history of funding through HHS. I think that the, um, the oral amendment that you offered, and I was corrected, I guess uh, it is a commissioner, I understand, but it's the Office of Higher Ed. Uh, but I don't think that making the Office of Higher Ed consulted with the grant would actually accomplish what we're trying to do. It would be more in the line of the appropriations. The first of the appropriations on page six would need to go someplace other than the Department of Health, which sits squarely in our budget. And, and I'm just very unlikely to get a target that allows me to help you. So. Um, I, I would go to the appropriation and try to direct it somewhere under the jurisdiction of the office of uh, the department, the, the committee over higher ed, and you stand a better chance of success. Um, Senator there. Nelson, and then Senator ben yes. and Senator Hayden, uh, then Senator Benson. Um, Madam Chair and Senator Lori, I really appreciate those comments and know that they were very heartfelt and difficult at the same time. And I understand the realities in which we live here. Uh, with our budget. Uh, my intention is to, uh, with the, if, should this committee so choose, uh, to pass this and send it to finance where we can take up the, your suggestion and do it in a very thoughtful manner. Um, and I have visited with Senator Bonoff as well. And so I think she's somewhat, never want to speak for another senator, but I think she might be expecting uh, this, uh, this legislation. So I uh, take your comments very seriously and definitely understand them and will work uh, to, to make this uh, bill a reality. 